Have you ever thought about building a mid-engine sports and racing car on a shoestring budget? That's exactly what Bernard Cox had in mind in 1967. It's not Italian and certainly not a Ferrari 246. It's the British GTM. So welcome again to the Seven Spot live chat area at the Newark Kit Car Festival 2023. And I'm really pleased to say we've got Derek from Handley Cars with us. Welcome, Derek. Hello. And what we're going to do is have a quick chat through the history of the the coupe, oh, uh, Cops, um, Handley, uh, and everybody else, Coon. Well, why don't we just throw you that up, uh, Derek? Just talk us through. Because we started off as a, as a, as a cop, so then went to you. So what was the... Uh, in yeah, it's 1966 to 1967, a bloke called, uh, oh, well, me. Well, I'm a cop, anyway. Yeah, some of you cops used to run a petrol station and make various clubman cars in the day. And uh, he decided he run give over part of his garage, his petrol station, and all the lubrication bay to a fellow racer called Jack Oscar. So he commissioned to build him a car. And we caught Steam TM, that car, which was first shown in the 1967 racing car show. Wow. And it uh, generated a lot of interest. And back in 1967, the only mid-engine car you could buy for the bone was a Lamborghini Miura. And so something based on a classic Mini was very, very sort of interesting for many people. It was, uh, you could build yourself what amounted to a proper mid-engine GT racer for mini money. And the many re at that point was probably only eight years old for the for the oldest cars, so it was quite up to date for that time. Oh yes, and the other side of that coin, eight years old, but well, there's still there were plenty you could find in breakers yards or certainly second hand ones that were that were just to be fines. And if you wanted to be very sort of uh, extravagant about it, you could break up a Mini Cooper S to the Toro seventy five engine in the back, and uh, you ended up with a proper little GT car that in the day they reckon would do 115 mile an hour top speed. Which was pretty impressive back, back then. That was they were probably lovely. He died about eight seconds, I think, which was also pretty impressive. So, so Cop started it off, and then how did it progress through hands after that? Well, Cop, well, he, with the initial success, everyone was wanted to find copies. So, we've some contracted the manufacturer to steal floor pan because a local boat building company take molds off his aluminium uh, uh, prototype. And so, we've subbed out on the, the fiberglass. And after about 30 cars, he decided that it was sort of more trouble than it was worth. And for the young first year, the, the aluminium body closed the pipe, the lad who had his father owned the garage on the other side of the road, who was winning, he, he won the Formula 3 championship. Yeah, there was a bloke called Howard Neary, who was also driving Cox's uh, demonstrator. I think mean, he sort of had a success in club races at that point. Oh, right, okay. And so when the uh, hit, hit um, Cop to lost the interest. Howard here we took it over with his father's help. His father being um, involved in making some sort of engineering things during the war. So he had the, the knowledge to so actually take it over and re engineer most of it to make it a lot more buildable. Here we also built both halves of it. They did the floor pans and the body. Uh, so the quality was a lot better. Uh, and they weigh about 170 cars. I'm all about the early shape, then they moved on the um, the shape with the uh, mini front bumper bar on it. And, and the, I know the one you made, but it's a bit different. And then you made about 160 of them. But they had visions of going into um, what I'm assuming is like the Datsun of the car. But like all these grand schemes, you know, you organise the finance, they, they got a director, they organise suitable premises, and then sort of, it all sort of fell through for one reason or another. Where did the, the coupe go next? Um, a yacht company in um, Scarborough way somewhere and did, in, in the end, did nothing with it. They, they sold that onto a firm called KNB in Welling there. Well, I think they won the car and sold spares. They'd sold Buttercream spare part for the existing fleet of green phase. And then that was the 1980 odd. And then Peter Beck, apparently, had a but he crashed and found K and me. And whilst he was chatting to them about spare parts for his car, they said, well, you know, we might be thinking about selling the whole project. He 
Peter Beck, he spent Paddy Fitch, and a third guy printed a little workshop in Nottingham and started making GTMs. Oh, wow, I didn't, that, that bit of the story I didn't realise. So, obviously, GTM developed from there, and as you know, of the, the other products such as the Libra, but how did the coupe fit and move along? Well, in 1980, when we picked it over, they built a few cars that was enough apparently to um, cover the cost, cover the cost. And then by the second and third year, they decided to re re engineer the front pad to make it easier to make. And also to take 13 inch wheels, because most people, you know, a 10 inch wheel car would sort of got out of fashion by then, really. So they moved out to the, the 13 inch wheel car, and so they re engineered to make it a bit easier to make. And also, they tended to sell the car in a more complete state. You, you bought the kit where the, the body, the doors had been fitted, the bonnet had been fitted. So it was a, an easier build of car. It, it wasn't just a part of bits. And, you know, there you go. They also wrote half decent of man instruction manual, the bill manual. I mean, they carried on with that for probably 15 years or so. And then they moved over to the Mossa, the ACMs. Of course, yes, yeah. And being fiberglass rather than steel ropes, though the Hossa was actually a um, fiberglass floor pad. Suited their manuals and they made all of it. And then the Metro came out with the K series ink and in, and they started using that as a dome in the K3, they called it. And then from the K3, we all moved on to the lead. Yeah. So, so at this point, have they effectively dropped the the coupe and they're concentrating on the Rossa and the K3. They're concentrating on their newer models. I think that the, the sort of final thing for them was they, they had out the steel floor pans and that there's some contract that wanted them to build, have 10 range. You could only do 10 at a time. And they sort of looked at the market and decided that they couldn't really afford to buy 10 up flight because they wanted to concentrate on what they were for their cars, i.e. the Rossa and the Libra by this time. So they sold the project on to a bloke called Pisa Leslie in the one car, but it was the eight of us. And then sadly, he called Anza. Oh dear. Westfield has been reviewed by such magazines as Evo and Autocar, and the Chesil Speedster 356 replica has been fully embraced by the classic car world. When these two brands were nearly lost last year when they went into receivership, it was feared they were never going to be seen again. But they were brought out of receivership by a brand new company called Westfield Chesil, and today we're going to learn what they're going to be doing with those two brands. Oh. And before I forget, GTM owners, we're going to ask about that as well. Okay, one of the points I've seen on the forums is questions about the sort of the missing models, one of them being the XTR 2 mm -hmm. and 4, yeah. and of course the other one is GTM, which is a one that regularly bubbles up. What's the situation with those cars? I think the first thing to say is that you can, if we try and bite or swallow everything right now, Chesel, Ice, EV, the Sport, the um, XTRs, GTM. There's just too much to do. A bit of indigestion. And, yeah, we'll get indigestion. It'll fail. It'll be a mess. So what we need to do is concentrate on what's readily available to us. In terms of uh, the XTR range, Westfield, although they had them advertised um, and and sort of available, they haven't made them in years um, in any in any particular number. So for us to put that back into production is a massive job. Same with the GTMs; it was sort of a stillborn project. 
they put a lot of effort into it mid 2000 and I don't know, 12 to 16 mm. sort of era, but they haven't really done anything with it in the last five years. So the game's not up for either of them, um, but the XTR definitely has been well overtaken by other products uh, out there and would need a massive rejig um, to, be a, to, to be a marketable product. The GTM, it's really difficult to see how much we've got left uh, of it um, and whether or not it's something we can breathe some life back into. When I was oof, probably eight years old, I went to a went to a sprint day in Wigan at the Three Sisters racetrack, and there was all these sevens and mm-hmm. and stuff. And you know, from the north of England, like light cars are what we do. Um, so I've, I'd grown up around minis, and grown up. I'm from like twenty minutes away from where mini sport is. So I'd grown up around minis, grown up around the sevens and rally cars and all that. And there's all the usual suspects, you know, there's a, there's a, a Rover V8 Westfield, there's uh, an Alpine A110, uh, there's all, all these lovely things, and then there's an incredibly battered GTM. And the guy had set fire to his parts car, and, oh, sorry, set fire to his nice project, and so instead raced his parts car. And there it was, and it had an aluminium front balance, and it was, it was stuffed, this thing. And I loved it. And there I was in front of all this expensive stuff. My dad's drooling over the Alpine and I don't care. And I just want this GTM. So for the, the people out there who haven't caught up with um, your YouTube channel and you yeah. really, really should, um, can you give 60 seconds quickly about what is the, the Mosquito, which is the name of your project? I don't know about 60 seconds because I'm known for taking my time when I talk, uh, <laughs> to put it lightly. You, you, but, <laughs> you've, already ta- you've already taken 15. <laughs> but uh, basically it was a GTM that had been crashed probably into a ditch, we think, but multiple crashes and it had set on fire. And I found it in a side yard in Normandy, dragged it home, and decided that it was too far gone to restore, but I couldn't let it die. I couldn't let it go to scrap. So we've gone full bananas on it, full custom chassis, full custom suspension. Um, the rear suspension is from a Honda CRV crossover. The engine is from a DC5 Integra Type R, which wow. is an RSX if you're American. The front suspension is MX5, but the steering is still mini. The size of the car is the same, but the wheelbase is longer and the uh, track width is wider. And when it's done, it'll have about 435 brake horsepower per ton because it'll weigh the same as the original GTM, wow. but it'll um, but it'll have like in excess of 265 horsepower. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another 7-Spot video. Uh, Today, we're discussing GTM, and we are pleased to have Ken Ross with us, a proud GTM coupe owner, and uh, to tell us about his amazing car. Uh, Ken, thank you so much for doing this with us. Yeah, welcome. Can I ask you something? Why did you choose the GTM, and what, I mean, what was the attraction? A... Back when I first got a driving license, which is many years ago now, uh, I had an old rusty Austin Mini. And Ah. at the time, those kit cars were at the forefront. And it was like, take your old rusty Mini, convert it into a a sports car, two-seater sports car. And that's what first attracted me to them. Mm -hmm. That was back in the 80s. Yeah, 1980. Uh, being young and not having a lot of ready money, eh, it took many years, uh, approximately 24 of them, uh, to be able to afford one. And at that point, the production had kind of come to a halt. So I started looking at the second-hand market and picked up the car that I currently have. I so that was, around, that was around the year 2000, was it? Yeah, I found it in 2004. Okay. Uh, lying in the back of a pallet factory uh, gathering dust. 
but at the time I wasn't in a position to restore a car. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, it's not the car for me. I'll keep looking. Several cars came and went. And 2006, I went back and said to the guy, right, I'm in a position now. I'm going to buy this one. I'm going to restore it. And uh, off I went uh, at that point. Well, and you did a restoration uh, to the original mini engine. Is that correct? Yep. I had a 1380cc uh, race engine in it oh, uh, nice. at the time. And mm -hmm. that was brisk. It did everything I wanted of it. But anyone that's lived with a, a race engine mini will know on long distances, it's very, very tiring. Uh -huh. uh, I went and put electronic, I built my own electronic ignition, mappable ignition system for it, fitted that. I fitted twin Webers, and it was a great car and did everything I wanted. But reliability, long distance cruising just didn't happen with it. It was an all and out, you know, very fast over a short distance, but that was it. Yeah. Uh, at that point, I decided that I wanted something with a five-speed gearbox. Mm -hmm. uh, many five-speed gearboxes are available, but very expensive. Yes. And the cheap option at the time was to find a Honda twin cam engine mm -hmm. uh, and fit that in the rear instead. So I went from 1380cc to 1600cc, a Honda a D-series engine. So it's much more uh, reliable and it doesn't peak out. Uh, it, it's, it's not so much of a dramatic drive on, on the upper revs. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, I went for the non VTEC version uh, because I hill climb and sprint the car. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be that high up the rev range before the power came in. Yeah. So I started with a, the D16, which has the low down torque. And, you know, I don't need the high revving VTEC engine. Yeah. And that brings me to the next question is, how do you use the car? Is it a daily for you or, or do you just use it for track use? A, a mix of everything. A, I use it in the summer as a, a road car. Mm -hmm. I, I do commute in it every now and again, but it's very small in modern traffic. Uh -huh. uh, I'm guessing very similar to your own traffic conditions. We have a lot of SUVs and things up here. Yes. And when you're level with the wheel nuts of the car, you feel very vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, uh, I do commute in it in the summer. The winter, it's no use in the snow. Do not try no. a car like this in the snow. Yeah. And I use it uh, at track days and I help climb and sprint it. So with that, yeah, I'm, no. going to, I'm going to say thank you, and I'm going to uh, look forward to adding to this story with your video and, uh, I'm, and some photographs uh, that you've got. And I'm going to wish you well and say thanks again for helping us with our, our story. Yeah, no problem whatsoever. I'm glad to get the GTM name out there and get more people familiar with it. This is where is this where you come into the story? Well, sort of. I mean, many years previous, I thought I think Splinter to the old times of the Lotus Island that I had at the time, by 1975, 74, 75. And I wanted to go circuit racing, but back in the day, road going sports cars didn't allow allowance in there with any sort of modification. 
alternative with mod sport lane so you can still really good at that with an iron needed all steel injured steel plague steel was like it was sort of mega money to get us off yeah right, up the but, top end yeah. so i sold the land and bought a gtm coupe that i made buying new of in the back of the someone's garage i bought that for 200 pounds back in 1976 and used that as a road car for four years and did a few bigs and hill climbs with it and then moved and so I got married and moved house and excited the gal out for a few years. And then the 750 motor time started a kit car series. Well, I thought, must get new car out of the gal. So I dust it off and bring it out. Yeah. You can get that a bit. So I likely took part in the very first kit car made series at the um, Brown Touch in 1984. And then nothing like that happened until 2013 or so. I came in with a bit of money. Ten years ago, yeah. Yeah, it's about 10 years ago and thought, I, I, well, I knew a bloke who did a, had a little sheet metal workshop. My man bad did a fairly big unit. And so I thought, I know what, I better go and make some sort of kit cars. I've been meaning to do it. So I sent such an early retirement and started doing that. And after a year of doing that, I then came across a guy, I'm sitting in university with Steve Shield. And by that time, they bought the molds and bites from Peter, Peter Leslie's widow. He lived in Chelmsford. I thought I was in uh, Great Zen. So not too far away. Too far away. So I thought, oh, why? It's an old built on the fabrication work. I've been letting me the body. I've been sort of seeing where it goes. But he then decided to move to them and sold me the molds and whites. So that means like to you in no, 2014 or so. So by that time, I had just the, the ability to make more and some rubber molds for the body. And so we were in business. First off, we're going to talk to Hambly, and they produced the great GTM Coupe. And we're here with Derek. Hello. Hi, Derek. Tell us a little bit what, about what you've got going on here, because obviously people know GTM as a brand that's gone on for a lot of years, but this is where it all started, wasn't it? This is, yes, this is the, um, well, the, the more, more modern version of the 13-inch the wheel version of the 10-inch wheel car that first okay. came out in 1967. Are they the were they called Heary ones, the original ones? The very, very first ones were called Cox. Oh, Cox, okay. And then Heary took them over and built a few, about a hundred. And then um, Peter and Paddy took over as GTM, yeah. and then became GTM Engineering and made about three hundred of these in, oh, okay. in the day. And um, what are you offering now? Are you still offering a kit ready to go? Um, I haven't quite got that far yet. We've got the mould. We, we, built this car complete using the molds we've got and the jigs and things but we, we haven't actually got together a kit yet so mainly the business is supplying spare parts to oh, okay. existing cars and replacement parts and i suppose with the number of people out there there's a, someone's always going to need a, a, a front or a back end or a door or, or those kind of bits yes and mainly the, the, because the, the floor pan is actually steel thin sheet steel it, it goes rusty eventually <sighs> Just because it's a kit car, they still rust, don't they? They make <laughs> yes. the steel, yeah. Yeah, so it's floor pans we do mainly. Oh, okay. And um, But you're looking in the future to try and create the kit again. And Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. And indeed, the other car we do is, a, like, I realised that classic mini, using classic mini bits as a donor is probably not the brightest of ideas these days. So you're looking to develop it for, for different underpinnings? Yes, the yeah. Fiesta. Oh, okay. And we've got the, the prototype, which I use for racing. There's a few pictures of it over there. You, and then, uh, yes, that's probably a better way to go. Oh, okay. And what, so that would suit the back end. And the front end, would that be something bespoke then? Because originally it had a mini subframe at the front, didn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, we make the little steel space frames that replace the mini subframe that then take the Fiesta running gear. And here we are today. It's having built an orange car with a mini boat and the Fiesta engine car. Yes, that does look quite a beast. We'll we'll cut in some shots of the of the yellow car. But as, as I said to you yesterday, well, we'll bike definitely not an A series engine than that. No, no, no. Well, one type of the orange car would be the mini bits. Bit. So I realised that mini bits now have the classic tag, and so they are quite expensive. I mean, there's very little you can't buy or you can't to get, but we've got one lots of money for them. So I then looked around and. The first car I did doing before I came across the Q-Build, I thought, 
I bought a great, uh, great damage repairable Fiesta that you will, you know. When, what else do I uh, um, base it on? You know, there's lots and lots in the mouth. It's an engine designed by Yamaha, lightweight, aluminium block. Uh, so it's, it's an idea of this lady, Jen. And so, uh, after building the orange car, I then chopped the, the front and back wings off the uh, the 30 inch wheel small pad, made my own sub frames, and put a Fiesta engine in the back. So I've raised them. So if someone's got a GTM coupe, they can come to you more or less for yeah, any body mould, for a chassis, so you can support all those. Yes, those just in coupons, we, we can supply the few most of us. And, and we have a reasonably well equipped machine shop, so we actually make my bit of stuff ourselves. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize that. Where we, yeah, we've got put things in the flies away, we've got mini, mini with you, you know, and uh, all the welding, just you can get in gold, the tea, gas, Guillotine, a cute okay. metal fold I would board now. So, yes, I mean, we could make the whole car, if you will. We get the wind screens at the special coming from China. And, uh, yes, uh, we, we can make all the roads. So. Oh, well, basically, I'm trying to think, I've had a discussion with somebody, I think it might be that um, Adam from CKC, is that with a lot of these older kit cars, I think if you've got an older button or something like that, the body panels, unless you find a second-hand one, you, you, you're stuffed, but it's so great to see that you're keeping the legend alive and that you're able to some yeah, survive yeah. bits for these older guys. Yes, yeah, we're really the TTN. But we've got the moulds for the 30-inch wheel car, and I, I know of people that have moulds for the 10 wheel car, so we can actually make classic replicas. Derek, that's been so informative, and I'm, hopefully people at home have enjoyed hearing the history of how the, the coupe has come from 1967 or 1966, 67 through to still being available in 2023. So I hope you really enjoyed that. We'll put a link to Derek's site below. And if you've enjoyed this video, and I hope you have, if you give us a like and a subscribe, we'd really appreciate it.